Okay, everyone. What's up? Goldie here. And we are back. And we're going to be going over the 12-game main slate that we have uh, here on Tuesday, June 6th. Uh, really, really interesting tournament slate, I think, here tonight. Several offenses that we can consider getting to um, less spread out, really, on the mound, as we kind of normally are on a 12-gamer. But We've still got a bunch of playable arms, I think, and, and some super exploitable ownership spots, I think. Um, you know, I generally like taking a little bit more risk on the mound with some pitchers. Um, and I certainly, you know, we, we obviously take a lot of risk in the batter's box as well. <clears throat> but this generally, this ownership figure is usually... Um, you know, our most exploitable number when we when we talk about starting pitching, right? There's a lot of variance with hitters, um, and we can't on any one day basis predict them or predict them with all that high a confidence level. We can do it a little bit better with pitchers, right? but there's still a ton of variance with these guys too, because pitchers are like the most enigmatic creatures in in the universe. Um, so focusing on exploitable ownership figures, I think, is is quite valuable. And using the projection aggregates that we've got here at True DFS, I think that provides a, a lot of value um, in seeing where the entirety of the market is. And, you know, we can certainly use that to our advantage. So that said, we do have projections uh, and ownership loaded to the site. These will change throughout the day. A lot of things will still happen, of course. So keep an eye out for updates as always. And let's just get into the games and see if we can't exploit some of these these ownership figures somewhere. Uh, let's start with the White Sox and the Yankees. Uh, this may be one of these spots that we can exploit here with uh, Giolito on the mound going for the Sox. Now, Giolito has, has been one of the best pitchers for the Sox all season. Um, even though he's still got a good bit of variance in him, uh, he's been markedly better this year than he has last or than he was last year. He has really reined in a lot of the problems against right-handers that he was, uh, displaying last year. The four-seamer was really, really bad. He was given up two and, and two and a half outs to the field for the majority of last season. And he has kind of swapped all of that value um, completely to the other side. He's actually eking out a little bit against the field now. So fastball command has been much better for Giolito. Um, still has problems with the changeup, however. So he's back toward a traditional split of, you know, giving up power to opposite-handed hitters than he was last year when he was just getting torched by same-handed hitters. So still very attackable number here. Um, and he throws his change up a lot, obviously, at a full 22%. He'll throw it a little bit to the righties as well. But it's mostly coming, you know, the problems are mostly coming from the left side of the plate. 258 average, that's a okay, but, you know, slightly elevated figure. 352 Woba, now we're starting to get a little carried away. 237 ISO very much attackable. Now he'll induce some soft contact, pushing 19% to both sides of the plate, which is very encouraging, and it's kept him in the ballpark uh, far more so than last year. But he's still on the barrel a little bit here at 10%, and that's because the changeup really is so bad. Slider has only been break-even so far this year for him. So despite the fact that he's he's establishing, um, he, he still has whiffs sort of yet to uncover. Um, but overall, this is kind of what Giolito is going to be this year, I think, uh, unless he somehow discovers how to eke out a bunch more value out of this slider changeup combination. This is probably where he's going to hover for most of the season, I would, I would assume. So that means we can attack him with left-handers. Um, huge ground ball to fly ball or fly ball to ground ball ratio, I should say. A lot of fly balls here, 67.5% to left-handers. Over a respectable 24 and two-thirds, 105 hitters here against the left side. 
that's very much attackable. So when it gets in the air on like a bad changeup, for example, it's going to go a long ways. And that's why we see a full 2.2 homers per nine. Probably a little bit noisy figure there. But 237 ISO, we're talking extra bases. And that's how Giolito is mostly attackable. So against righties, he is, he's been much better. He's still giving up some pop. And as we mentioned, you know, on the barrel a little bit with some hard contact there. So it's not totally eliminated. It's far more under control, however. So I think this is an exploitable spot for the Yankees. I think there's some hidden value that Giolito has left to uncover. But I think there's all also some value now that the Yankees are healthy, uh, even though they may or may not have just lost Aaron Judge. Um, with Stanton and Donaldson back in the lineup, they still make a lot of hard contact even against righties, and even though they strike out at a very high clip as well. So um, this 24% is only about a tick above average. So I think it's an exploitable spot for Giolito to get after some of these Yankees, especially if they're missing Judge, but it almost might even be a downgrade because Judge will still strike out. Um, so mostly I'm, I'm not super thrilled with an 8,900 for Giolito. I really do like 5%, 6% ownership here. Um, I think this is a very exploitable figure. I think there's upside for him to perform more often than one in, in 20 shots or, or whatever we're, we're getting here. So um, overall, I think the projection, medium projection, maybe a tick low to me here in the early going, but um, I don't really have many gripes with this. It's mostly the price tag that's probably going to keep me off of Giolito, but I do admittedly really like the ownership, and I think the matchup is okay. We can go after the Yankees here still with some righties. They're just an average offense, and they just lost their best hitter if Judge is indeed out with a busted toe or, or you know whatever they're doing here. So, um, I think Giolito's in play if you land on an 8,900. I probably wouldn't totally X him out of the pool, because um, I, I think he's still got 25 in him here, and I think that's a, a very serviceable score. On the other side, Clark Schmidt, 7,900. I, man, I can't peg this guy. Like, uh, I really like attacking, attacking Clark Schmidt. Because he's got horrible, horrible numbers to the left side of the plate still. And this really isn't getting any better. His numbers are very similar to Giolito's, as a matter of fact. He, however, walks more people. Didn't give up near as many fly balls, so that's good. But a lot more of those are on a line uh, for Clarkie over here. So um, he doesn't really throw a change up in aggregate too much, just 2%. He throws it about 5 6% to the left side, though. Uh, so that's a very attackable pitch, absolutely. He throws this cutter. He's really balanced in the in the two seamer and and cutter mix here, um, but really he's still yet to figure it out. And overall, he's given up quite a lot to the field on the fastball mix with the sinker cutter, giving up over two outs. So the slider really has allowed him to survive against very right-handed heavy lineups, and certainly that's what the White Sox are. They're very much attackable with good right-handers that have good whiff stuff. 81 WRC plus in aggregate. Average strikeout right here. They don't walk a lot, and they don't really make a, hot, a lot of hard contact or hit for some power. So against the White Sox, I think Clark Schmidt is in play. I'm pretty sure that I don't want to be clicking in a full six of my teams here. Uh, with 7,900, I'm also not super excited about this price tag. I think he's very attackable. Um Definitely with lefties, like he gives up production all over the place to these guys. 330 average, 415 Wobe, and a 239 ISO to that side. Plus the walks, north of 10%. Uh, the hard contact isn't super worrisome against lefties, 31, 30, 30, 31%, give or take. But it's it's barrel contact mostly to them. Where I think he's more a little bit more attackable is with some right-handers. He's vulnerable with just a buck 22 ground ball to fly ball here. That's not high enough to be giving up a full 35% hard contact. So I'm a little worried about Clarkie getting really blown apart here uh, by some right-handers because the slider is just a break-even pitch. So if he's on the downside of the variance, um, that, that means he's not working with anything valuable. Right? He doesn't have a lot of swing and miss without the slider curveball if they're on the downside of the variance here. So um, not super excited about playing Clark. Certainly not at a full 15% of my teams, to be honest. So I'm kind of lukewarm on pitching here, and I'm also kind of lukewarm on offense. I think both of these guys are serviceable, and they can work through both of these matchups really without too much issue. But 
I'm a little concerned with the underlying metrics here. So I think there's probably just some other guys I'd like to play. A little bit cheaper than Clarky, a little bit more expensive than Giolito. And not super excited about playing the offenses on either side. Uh, I think Giolito is better than the Yankees. And I'm not, I think Clark Schmidt is better than the White Sox here. But um, yeah, not so much so. That, that there's about seven other offenses I think I'd rather get to. So they're probably going to be on the short list. Uh, it, really on the bubble for me, I think. Um, pretty much everybody here, but I think there's some playable pieces in the game if you land on some of them. Okay, let's move on. Oakland and Pittsburgh. James Caprillion, I don't think he is a playable piece. Certainly certainly not by any of the fundamental metrics here, right? Uh, the strikeout stuff is actually a little bit better for Cap this season than it was last year, but the walks are still a problem. Barrel rate is far better. It's about four ticks better than it was last year. So he's got that under control a little bit, and this is a very good number for him. And what one which will make him difficult to stack against in Oakland. However, this is in Pittsburgh. It's a little bit more hitter friendly than Oakland. Not so much, but it's still a, you know, pitcher's ballpark. Um, so with cap here, it, he's still getting torched by left-handers. Uh, this isn't necessarily just, you know, kind of short sample noise that we're dealing with. Maybe a three and a half homers per nine is at just 82 hitters faced this season, but He's had problems really to both sides of the plate in average uh, for quite some time now. 318 to the lefties with a 291 to right-handers. And we're not talking about super short samples um, when it comes to batting average necessarily. The Woba's very high to lefties in particular, 461 with a 349 ISO to them and just a 16% K rate with a full 39% hard contact. So despite the fact that he's gotten the barrel contact under control a little bit. There's still a lot of very loud contact, average exit velo of 90 miles an hour, and that's to both sides of the plate. It's pretty outsized here, 39% in aggregate, and it's just 38.5% to the right side. So that hasn't translated so much into power necessarily because a lot of his starts this year have come in Oakland, and he's got three appearances out of the bullpen too. He had to get moved out of the starting rotation at the beginning of the season because he was awful. So I think there's still some attackability here for the righties as well, even though he hasn't given up a lot of power to them this year. Um, and he does have the 25% whiffs. That's keeping them off the board a little bit. And once again, that's another one of these figures that will make him difficult to stack against in big ballparks. So that kind of takes me off of Pittsburgh just a little bit. However, these numbers to lefties, like I said, have been have really persisted. Uh, for the last couple of seasons, and he's very much tackable, and Pittsburgh's really just kind of too cheap here. So they're popping very hard in ownership and in value so far um, in early runs, and I think it's perfectly warranted. The ballpark does kind of take me off, and Cap being such a heavy fly ball pitcher with less barrel contact than in previous seasons, I think you could maybe get off of a little bit. Um, that said, I'm not going to be fading Pittsburgh or, you know, taking any strong stands against them tonight. I think Tuki Marcano is probably the best value shortstop of the day at 2,100. He'll probably lead off. Brian Reynolds back down to 5,000 is a very playable price tag, and this is a super playable spot, of course. But you can get to a McCutcheon at 45 or a Cabrian Hayes at 4,000. Neutral to heavy ground ball hitters are, are Kutch and, and Hayes, respectively. And this will match up well batted ball-wise for them against uh, Caprillion. And, of course, Jack Sawinski, I, I play him pretty much every day. He's 3,000. He's been very cold recently, but still hits the baseball hard, and Cap's definitely going to give that up. So I think pretty much all of Pittsburgh is very playable outside of, like, an Austin head or whoever they have behind the plate. Um Everybody else, though, is, is very much in play. And if you can mix in some some cheaper pirates to get to your more expensive stacks elsewhere, like the Dodgers or, you know, a couple of these teams that we'll talk about. I think that's playable. You might have to make some decisions on the mound to get contrarian, but um, fundamentally, this is a, an excellent spot for the pirates going after cap. Mitch Keller on the mound is an excellent spot for him as well. And he's at 20, 21% right now. There's another guy we'll talk about in the next couple of games who's seeing, um, 
you know, quite a bit more ownership. This is the guy I'd like to play personally. Uh, I've, I've been drooling over Mitch Keller for his last several starts. Now above 10,000, he's yet to pay off this one of these price tags, and he's had three number or three games up here above this number. Uh, actually, this is the third, so he's had two. And he's given up some production in his last two outings. But the strikeout stuff has still been there. Against Seattle, where he got picked apart for six earned, he still struck out eight in six innings. And against San Francisco in his last start, he struck out eight in six innings and gave up four runs. So um, still got wins out of those games, so it didn't keep him uh, super depressed in the actual raw DK point production category right still pop for 19 in his last start against san francisco and 15 against seattle but we like playing pitchers with a floor and that's what the strikeout stuff gives mitch keller here and this is oakland this is the best matchup in baseball for a right hander 78 wrc plus 26 this is three ticks above average this is the highest split adjusted number on the day as a matter of fact strikeout rate wise against right-handed pitching just 27.5% hard. We want Oakland more so against lefties than we do against righties. And Mitch Keller is every bit an ace here. So uh, he's still working on this change. It is still a pretty bad pitch. So uh, with the slider, curveball, change, mix, all of his secondary pitches, out, you know, non-fastball pitches, I should say, are really not giving him any value. So that's how he's gotten picked apart a little bit. I think this is a good matchup for him to to get off the schneid and for the slider and the curveball to see positive variance here because Oakland is so, so bad. Uh, the four-seamer cutter sinker, they're still going to allow him to establish early in counts and get to counts where he can throw, you know, choose when to throw a slider, choose when to throw a curveball rather than having to chase the pitches, so to speak, to get swing and miss. So I do like a, a big floor here, and I think suppression is very much within range as well and unlikely to get super beat up again against Oakland. So I like Mitch Keller and the Pirates definitely. I'm probably just going to leave all of Oakland on the shelf here today outside of my usual Seth Brown against a righty. Okay, let's move on. Arizona and Washington. Uh, Tommy Henry on the mound, he had his best start really of his career against Colorado, and you know we've been kind of attacking Colorado with lefties all season. Um, Washington, on the other hand, they've been much more difficult to attack with lefties and with righties for that matter than Colorado. And I think this is a spot that not necessarily we would want to get to some of the nationals because they still don't hit for any power. There is just very little upside for them. They do create, however, at a 113 WRC plus they don't strike out and they get on base, right? They hit some line drives here at a 22 and a half percent clip. That's an elevated figure for a team aggregate it's the hard contact and the power numbers that are really leaving it on the table but they've got some guys with speed here that can move around the base paths and you know get to get a ball down a line occasionally uh steal a base you know notably like a uh lane thomas he's got a little bit of speed certainly some pop as well um joey manessis not so much in the speed but definitely the pop Jamer has been really okay from both sides of the plate. He's kind of reg slowing down a little bit, certainly, from his, his early season production. But Stone Garrett definitely has uh, some pop, and he's got a lot of speed as well. So I'm not sure if they, I, I really... I, they're definitely cheap, right? We can play some Nationals as filler pieces, um, and they really always pop in terms of value because they're all still under 4,000 outside of Lane Thomas at 4,400. Um they're playable attacking some Tommy Henry because he's still got some pretty serious uh, strikeout rate problems, even though he struck out a full K in inning against the Rockies in his last outing. He's got a very high strand rate here himself. So looking for a little bit of regression between the ERA at about 375 and the XFIP up at nearly five and a half. So um, still some noise coming here. He's got a very good changeup. He could keep some of these righties off of off balance. So I'm not jacked about playing a lot of the righties from Washington, but I think they are in play in maybe some short stacks like a Joey Manessis, uh, Stone Garrett. Alex Call is very cheap. You can play Lane Thomas at the top of the lineup as well. I think that's how I'd like to go after Tommy Henry at 7,000. I just don't think he's in play enough here. He just doesn't have that kind of floor that we talked about with Mitch Keller in this particular matchup. They're just not going to strike out, and they're going to put the ball in play 
So despite a good changeup and curveball mix here, it's fastball command. He needs to establish, does Tommy Henry, to really get me excited about going after bad strikeout matchups. We need to see this number tick up quite a bit. So um, the Nationals are okay here, not super jacked about playing Tommy Henry. Jake Irvin on the other side, same thing with him. He's got higher walk rate problems and strikeout rate problems as well with a pushing 10% barrel rate. Now, he's had a couple of bad matchups, um, but here in the early going for Irvin, uh, I don't think he's really in play either, even at, what, 1700 cheaper than Tommy Henry. Um, he's giving it up an average, mostly to the left side, giving it up power there as well. Hard contact at an aggregate 33%, very attackable for sure, and a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy. So with Arizona, I really like going after kind of below average arms with this offense. I think they're very, very, very dangerous. One, just a 105 aggregate WRC plus for them, 20% strikeout rates, about three ticks better than average. 175, 180 ISO nearly with a 33% hard contact. So that's what makes them far more playable than even the Nationals on the other side who create runs at a, what, 8% higher clip here. So um, I'd much prefer to get to Arizona and go after Jake Irvin than Washington going after Tommy Henry here. And I think the market kind of agreeing here, not so much in ownership. We'll see some, some teams pop for higher ownership than Arizona, which... I think makes them a very, very viable tournament stack here. They're good in filler stacks. They're good in full stacks. And they're a very playable price tags. Pretty much every one of these guys. I think you can play righties. You can play lefties. Because the short sample here, um, we're really not sure what Irvin is going to display long term against same-handed hitters. So I think uh, Christian Walker, 41. Lourdes Gurriel, 43. Those guys are playable from the right side of the plate. Gabby Moreno, not a lot of power upside but he's a fine contact catcher piece if you want to get there so mostly Arizona here for me and probably no pitching really at all maybe some short Washington pieces here or there okay Houston and Toronto let's move on 10-3 on the mound for Hunter Brown um, I think this is an okay spot for for Hunter Brown and what I really want to exploit here is the is the very low ownership figure I think one in 33 times um Hunter Brown's going to get there for us against Toronto. He's got a an equitable slider, good fastball here, not throwing the change up enough. It's the curveball that's really getting him kind of beat, beat up by both righties and lefties, and that's kind of what worries me a little bit. He gives it up a good bit to the right side, um, the, on the curveball at least, and the slider value, he's not burying this enough. So he's throwing this a bit more for these two pitches, a bit more for strikes, really, than I think he should be. And that would translate, if he threw it out of the strike zone, a little bit more to some more chase and some more whiffs. Just a 28% O swing rate at the moment. When As soon as he develops that, we've mentioned this a couple times before, as soon as he develops out this change a little bit more, that'll give him some more whiffs to the left side. Not necessarily needing it right now, but... Um, and not necessarily going to need it in this matchup necessarily. So he's probably going to leave this pitch totally on the shelf. He doesn't throw it to same-handed hitters pretty much at all. But, you know, there's a, a Brandon Belt or a Dalton Varsho, Kevin Kiermeyer type of lefty that may you may see this pitch surface a little bit. Um, so he can keep those guys off balance here. And the four-seamer slider mix, I think, is... This is a plus matchup for a decent slider, and that's what Hunter Brown has. Um, so I think this is an okay spot, despite a very kind of scary spot, really, for any right-hander against Toronto. 115 WRC+, plus, 34% hard contact. They leave it on the table a little bit with the power, just a 166 ISO, but they don't strike out a lot, and neutral ground ball to fly ball with some line drives here makes them a pretty deadly offense, even in the downside of their split when most of their guys are right-handed. So... I think this is an attackable spot for Hunter Brown, as we've mentioned a few times with Toronto this season. You need guys, if you're going after them, that have very good whiff stuff and a really good breaking pitch arsenal. And the curveball, not so much very good, but the slider is good enough. He'll throw this a lot more to the righties than um, than he will the curveball. So 
it's still an equitable breaking arsenal arsenal for him. And I think it's an attackable spot and a very exploitable ownership figure here. He's got just as much upside as Kevin Gosman. Not to say that Kevin Gosman's a bad play, but he's 700 more expensive. And there are two other guys now that we talked about, Mitch Keller and Hunter Brown. I think I'd rather play because they're not nearly as pos- not nearly as popular. So at 35%, he'll push 40% and, and maybe even higher in some particular contest. And I, and I think that's exploitable. I don't think he's that big of a favorite. Um, in his respective match, he still gets Houston over here, right? Over Hunter Brown and and a Mitch Keller, for example. Like the matchup for Mitch Keller is far, far better than Kevin Gosman um, here tonight against the Astros, right? Now, even though Altuve is back out again, this is just an average aggregate offense against right-handed pitching, and Gosman's an above-average right-hander, of course. Uh, but that said, Houston has certainly been heating up recently. Their numbers are starting to drift up. As they're getting their guys back healthy, Chas McCormick is back, of course. And even with Altuve back out, um, there's, what, four guys at the top of the lineup that are not really going to strike out hardly at all. Mo Dubone's got a 12% strikeout rate or something. Jordan Alvarez, Alex Bregman, and Kyle Tucker, all very difficult outs at the top also. Uh, Jeremy Pena, he's really the free out up there in terms of strikeout stuff. He's got a high chase rate, high um, raw K rate. So there's a strikeout there. And then when once you get down to you know the 6 through 9, there's certainly some strikeouts at the bottom half of the lineup for Gosman. So I think that's perfectly fine, but he certainly has a much more difficult matchup than Mitch Keller, right? And this is why I mentioned that at just a $100 difference here, 11,000 to 10-9, I'd much rather play Mitch Keller because Oakland is far, far worse, and there's far more strikeouts in the lineup. Um for for Mitch Keller than are, are for Kevin Gosman, right? Just 22.5% in aggregate, and Oakland, is, let's go back to it quickly here, is at, what, 26%, right, against righties. And 3.5%, 3.5% when you're talking a floor in strikeouts for a starting pitcher, right? So um, nothing wrong fundamentally with Gosman a little. I mean, he doesn't walk people. He throws a hell of a lot of strikes. He's going deeper into games this year. And he certainly has the upside to pick through this lineup, even the top four or five guys. That's not a problem. It's really just a price tag construction and mostly just an ownership figure here that's making me balk. Um, I'd rather just play the other two guys, even a Hunter Brown. I don't think that Gosman is a 10 to 1 favorite to outperform him tonight. I know it's not you know, a direct comparison here, because, but even still, given the owner or given the price discount as well, um, I think that puts me on to a Hunter Brown, if I had to choose between the two, a little bit more than a Kevin Gosman. So nothing wrong with um, playing Gosman or Hunter Brown here tonight, but I think the, you know, these are both very difficult matchups. You want to fade both of these guys, just eat all the Mitch Keller you can, then, you know, you're not going to get any argue, argument from me. But uh, I think if I had to choose, I would probably stay off of a little bit of the Gosman. Uh, I respect Houston's lineup far more than uh, I do Oakland, for example. Okay, let's move on. Uh, L.A. and the Reds. Dodgers here getting a very attackable arm in Luke Weaver on the mound for Cincinnati. Uh, Tony Gonsolin going for the Dodgers. And I'd like to play. I'd taken some shots with Gonsolin, right? He's stretched out now. I, I've mentioned this over his last several starts. He's still at a playable price tag, but where's the whiff stuff, Tony? Like, like we got to... You need a floor, and on a full 12-game slate, there's plenty of other guys here. I think that have a little bit more of a floor here than Tony Gonsolin does. Um, so despite the fact that the Reds are or the Dodgers are coming in as the most popular, both in, in value and certainly in ownership here, they're popping the hardest, I think you could play some Reds as well because Tony's just not throwing it past anybody. He's walking some guys. He's still throwing a lot of strikes, but he's struggling deeper in accounts with the lack of value on the slide up and the cur- slider and the curveball so far. So um, he's not getting near as many ground balls as he has in the past, and he's given up some hard contact north of 30% really to both sides here. Now we got some short sample noise to flesh out, definitely, and this is a plus matchup for a good arm, and Tony Gonsolin is certainly a good arm. But I don't really want to play him because I don't think he's going to be able to throw it past these guys all that regularly. They vote their only strikeout at about a tick above average here, but they walk at a full 10%. That makes them a, a pretty sticky offense and kind of um, yeah, 
hidden value on the Reds a lot of the time against right-handers. They don't hit for a lot of power, of course, and, and not a lot of hard contact. With the raw WRC Plus at 87 here, of course, that makes them an attackable team with a good right-hander that has some K-stuff. But Gonsolin really doesn't display that. So I think I'd like to mostly stay off of that and not even play correlated stacks with him tonight. I just don't think the upside is going to be there for him. I'd like to probably get to a few Reds pieces if I can. This offense has been heating up a little bit recently, and I think the best play over here from them is Jake Fraley at 4,600. They'll probably have him lead off, and this kid absolutely rakes. So I think it's a very good price for him. It'll be probably pretty popular since Gonsolin's not going to throw it past any righty or lefty, really. Um Oh, so you might have to eat 10, 12% on the guy, but I think this is a very good play over here uh, from Cincinnati. You can play Matt McLean as well, 4,500. They get this playable price, and he's a really good hitter himself. Johnny India has is displaying a little bit more of his sort of rookie season upside in terms of power over the last you know week or so. Spencer Steer's really starting to come into his own, getting everyday at bats also. Uh, Nick Senzel got multi position eligibility back and with. Some outfield playability now, and he's at a playable 4,000. Tyler Stevenson has, a, you know, the power really hasn't returned just yet with all of the injuries here, but he's at a, a playable 4,200. So if you want to get to a, an off-the-board kind of red stack, I think that's a playable piece as well uh, in tournaments here. If you want to stack this game, if you can make it happen price-wise, yeah, go ahead, because we're not, we're certainly not playing Luke Weaver. He's giving it up to everybody um, in terms of power, 250 ISO to the lefties, 281 ISO to the righties. He survived in a couple of his starts, but I think that's probably going to change here. Yeah, the homer per nine numbers are uh, noisy here in the in the short 43 and two-thirds that we've got. 6% raw homer rate, it, it's probably going to come down. But the barrel rate at a full 11% here, this is a very worrisome figure. Aggregate 22.5% K rate. Dodgers are going to platoon against him here, and he's only got a 17.5% strikeout rate to the lefties here. That's because he doesn't have a changeup, and he's got a bad four-seamer cutter mix that he's giving up a lot of outs to the field here. It's the curveball that's really allowed him to survive, um, but he'll be a one-pitch guy, and he's not getting a lot of whiffs on the curveball to the left side. So he's going to give up hard contact really to both sides, and that's not a recipe for success against the Dodgers. So if you can make full game stacks happen, I think that's playable. Um, Dodgers are, are absolutely the top stack of the day. It's just ownership and, and price tag that you got to balance with them. Okay, let's move on. Boston and Cleveland, 8,600 on the mounds for James Paxton. Ugh. Um, I'm still kind of in wait and see mode with Paxton. I think there's some underlying noise here uh, really in the early going. Certainly the strand rate, right? Um, we do... Uh, show some positive or potential positive regression to come for him to the tune of about, you know, three quarters of a run between the ERA and the XFIP. Um, but he's got some susceptibility in the strike one rate. I need this to be a little bit higher for Paxton because I think the strikeout rate here is a little bit noisy in the, in the early going. And I think that there's some, um, some attackability in, in the variance that Paxton's likely to show. I think the strikeout rate will probably come down if the first strike, uh, the strike one rate doesn't come up. Easy for me to say. Um, we need a little bit more chase out of Paxton. Now, undeniably, the, you know, the swing strike, called strike, and ultimate CSW at 29%, this is fine so far. And he's had three pretty decent starts. Um, did get picked apart and went only three innings against the Angels. But he's had... Some okay matchups. Of course, St. Louis in his first start back, nobody really knew what to expect from Boss, uh, from Paxton. So that's an acceptable um, kind of variant start that we saw. He struck out nine, though. Like, if he played the Cardinals ten times, I can guarantee he's not going to strike out nine in five innings every single start. So a little noisy there. Same thing against, um, against Cincinnati. Is he likely to strike out eight? in five innings and every every time he faces that particular offense? Probably not. So I think there's a little bit of shenanigans going on here uh, in the raw strikeout stuff. And this is a bad strikeout matchup. man. It's, it's difficult for me to get excited about playing guys um, against Cleveland just in general. They don't strike out against lefties at an 18% clip here. And we got full 600 PAs. This has converged pretty well. 
two months through the season here. What makes them very attackable, of course, is that the offense is awful. They do not create at all. They can't get anybody on base. They don't hit for any hard contact or extra bases. And they hit a lot of ground balls. So that makes them very attackable, which I think puts me on to Paxton just a little bit. Certainly not at a full 13% here. And I'm still not super jacked about the price tag. I think if you land on 5 8 10% of... Of Paxton teams, I think that's probably okay. I'm not going to X him out of the pool necessarily because I do think there's a little bit of suppression upside. But I do want to see him, like, I need to see, like, seven inning upside out of a guy at 8,600, I think. And I'm not sure that even in the, that in this particular matchup, um, even against a very bad offense, that he's really got a full seven innings in him. Could he get there in, in six innings and strike out five or something like that uh, and not give up any production? Yeah, I think that's playable. And that's serviceable, and that makes him a little bit playable. Um, that said, like, I'm not super excited about it. Like, he's got a 13% barrel rate here in the early going, right? So with a depressed strike one rate, some chase that's sub 30%, a very high strand rate, high barrel rate, and a lot of hard contact here, 40, 50% nearly to both sides. He's only seen 80 hitters, so let's not get carried away with it, but... Um, these contact numbers absolutely have to come down. It is a good spot for that to happen, of course. He's not going to give up 50% hard contact necessarily to Cleveland, right? But uh, so that makes him a playable piece. If you land on this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't gripe too hard. I don't think. Bieber on the other mat, I think I probably would gripe uh, a little bit hard about this. I think this projection for Bieber here is too high as a median figure. Um, now, it's not strike throwing or walking people or anything like that. Bieber's just thrown too many strikes, right? He's, he's not throwing it past anybody at all this season. He's down to a 17% strikeout rate now, and this is at least five ticks lower than it was last year. And against lefties in particular, it's about seven ticks lower. So eight ticks lower. Um, he's historically been far better against lefties than he has against righties. But look at this average figure that he's giving up to the lefties this season. 304 with a 365 Woba and a 177 ISO. He's very much attackable with the left side of the plate. And we know that Boston can platoon with some really good lefties that don't strike out at all. In Alex Verdugo, Rafi Devers, Masataki Yoshida, you know, the other lefties, yeah, they'll strike out. Um, but they're still going to hit for a lot of power. Jaron Duran, Tristan Casas, Manny Valdez, even Arish McGuire here or there. So I think this is a very difficult spot for Shane Bieber. Mostly it's the price tag that's keeping me off here. I think this own, or this projection is a little bit too high. I don't. Th this is not the same Bieber that it was, you know, that we've seen for really the last five seasons. Um the, the strikeout stuff just is not there. And if he gives up just even two runs, it's going to be super difficult for him to overcome that anymore with just a 17% aggregate K rate. So we need a floor when we're paying this much for a starting pitcher. And I don't think it's there for Bieber in this particular matchup. Um, you know, just an average creation here, but Boston's super dangerous. Obviously, Shane Bieber's an above average arm, so we can't really expect Bieber to get mega torn apart here but this is a very dangerous spot and i think this this projection and and this price tag combination is going to keep me off almost completely just a, a couple other guys one we'll get to later on that i think is far more playable uh than bieber here against boston so i'm going to leave him on the shelf and obviously leaving cleveland on the shelf even though their offense has been heating up a little bit more and I, i'm still just in wait and see mode with paxton for the most part i'll get a couple of pieces here or there but um, I'm certainly not going to have like a full 15%. Like, I don't think it's warranted trying to get leverage on the field with him. Okay, let's move on. Mets and Braves. Uh, Cookie Carrasco, definitely not warranted trying to get leverage on the field, even at 1% ownership here against the Braves. Uh, Braves are a top five stack for sure. Um, certainly they're in ownership so far. In value, not so much because they're you know, very much expensive, uh, as they've really been all season. But this is a super attackable spot against Cookie his last two starts have been good, having come off the DL. Um, his first start after he came off the DL was you know, not good. But I'm worried about depth with Cookie, and he certainly hasn't displayed any whiff stuff whatsoever. So he's pitching to way too much contact, full 80% here, and he's given up a lot of really loud contact. He's walking guys, not throwing strike one. He's elevating his own pitch count. So that prevents him from going deep into the game here, and 
when we attack Atlanta, we need guys that have whiff stuff that can go deep into a game and realize a full K and inning because Atlanta is going to put, they're going to score, man. And when they put up runs, you still need a very high floor to overcome that. And cookie just doesn't have it. So even at 5,900 at a very playable price tag, buying seasonal lows on him, if we choose to buy it, but, uh, I'm not doing it. So be my guest. Um, give me a lot of the Braves and as much of the Braves as I can get, they're going to be hard to squeeze in. So you're going to have to play, you know, Eddie's fi- price is finally coming up. He's 3,100 now, but he's still in the five hole and cookie's not going to throw it past him. So let's do it. Um, and you're going to have to play somebody like, I don't know, Marcelo Zuna who hits balls to the wall and turns them into singles somehow. Uh, or in our Orlando Arcia, who's playable at shortstop. Not my favorite thirty-eight hundred dollar price tag for him, but Michael Harris at three thousand, I think it's very much playable. And of course, every other one of the top six very much in play. So give me as much of the Braves as we can get against Cookie. Um, I I think Cookie has probably reached the end of the line here, or very close to it. He's just not throwing it past anybody, and he's putting too many people on base. The the outings are not all that serviceable. Um, maybe he can survive a little bit longer by striking out half a K or, you know, getting a half a K an inning or something like that. But his last two starts are certainly noisy because he got wins out of both of them. And he still only popped for 20 DK points, give or take. So um, I think he's totally out of out of play here, even at a, a nice 5,900 price tag. Bryce Elder on the mound. I think we get it. We have to start taking some shorts on Elder here. Uh, this high hard contact number is just way too high. And he's got an 87% strain rate. This is not sustainable. He's got a 2-0 ERA with expected metrics, a run and a half, and even a full two runs higher. Um, he doesn't throw it past anybody. I, I know the ground ball stuff is good. I've said this his last few starts. And I mentioned it in his last start. It's probably not going to be today when he had Oakland that we start to see the regression. Um, but against the Mets, the Mets are still a better offense than Oakland, even though they're not all that great. Against right-handed pitching, just a 101 WRC plus, but they'll hit for more hard contact, and they walk a good bit. Nine percent clip as an aggregate, it's fine for a, a full team. It, it's really the strikeout rate at, at sub 20 percent. This is three ticks above average, and even though they're not going to hit for power, sub 150 ISO, uh, they're still going to make a lot of contact and make it difficult on starting pitcher that doesn't have a lot of whiff stuff. He's only got a 21 percent aggregate strikeout rate here. And when you're giving up this much hard contact, I don't care who it is, you're you're going to get blown apart eventually. It's fastballs that he's really leaving a lot of equity on the table with. And he's throwing a two-seamer, and he throws it a lot to both sides of the plate. And with a bad two-seamer, if you're throwing that to opposite-handed hitters, eventually you're going to get really picked apart. Um, he's got slider value that's really just off the charts here, three and a half outs above average. And that's going to come down as we get more or deeper into Elder's career here. This hard contact, these contact numbers are, are just not sustainable uh, long term. A 4-0 ground ball to fly ball. I'm still looking for this to come down against right-handers. Um, and I think we have to start taking some shots. Really, pretty much with any respectable spot against Elder. Um, it, I mean, any team that is not Oakland or Kansas City, right? And the Mets are certainly not Oakland or Kansas City. So I'm going to start taking shots against him. And I'm I'm counting on regression to happen and happen very quickly at some point. He's going to put some guys on base. And, yeah, he might be on the down end of some batted balls in play. Um, soft contact would might get there for him. He's gotten a lot of outs on very hard hit balls so far. So this is going to even out eventually. And... Uh, who knows? Maybe five years from now, he, he makes me look like an idiot. But uh, I'm going to start taking shots against him. I think the price tag's too high, so he can't play him. Uh, I rarely play guys against the Mets anyway. I need guys that can throw it past them. Um, and those that are, don't have a 90% strand rate for me to get really excited. So uh, I'm taking shots against Elder here. And I think he can get to the other side of this game and play some Mets as well. I like Nimmo's price at 43. I like Lindor at 47. And Jeff McNeil, he hits a lot of ground balls, but he's a high contact hitter and he's, you know, in the two hole or in the three hole at 3,500. So sign me up. And Pete Alonso, of course, you can mix in a, a piece or here down at the bottom of the lineup. So I'd probably prefer just short stacks because of the ground ball rate, but I'm counting on heavy, heavy regression as well. So um, 
that puts full stacks in play for me also. So that's how I'm going to approach this game. Really no pitching at all. And I'm going to attack with both Atlanta, but the Mets as well. I like their prices better, certainly. Okay, let's move on. Baltimore and Milwaukee. Kyle Gibson on the mound. 7,500. Ugh, I just hate playing Kyle Gibson. Um, I, he just doesn't have any strikeout stuff. And I think against Milwaukee, you know, this is an above average matchup for a, a right-hander. Uh, this is a below average offensive team against right-handed pitching. 93 WRC plus, above average or below average. Strikeout rate, 23.5%. Um, but it's right around the league average. 32.5% hard. They'll hit for a little bit of pop. Um, but they pop a lot of balls up, right? So this neutral-ish buck 20 ground ball to fly ball, it's a little misleading because a lot of their fly ball, I mean, that's 12%. You need this down at like 8 or 9% to get uh, really encouraged that they're making solid barrel contact and it turns into base hits, right? So that doesn't translate into high ISO. And as we see here, it's just an average 150 ISO. Um, so this is an attackable spot for Kyle Gibson. He's actually had three pitches that are working for him this season, but it's not really to either side of the plate in an outsized proportion. Yeah, he's been better at suppressing contact and production against the right side. And that's really coming from the slider. He's throwing a, a same-handed change a little bit as well. And the two-seamer is an okay same-handed pitch, but he's giving back all of the value that he's getting on the two-seamer right back to the field with a bad cutter and a bad four-seamer. So really, it's just the slider and the change that are allowing him to survive here. And these are fine pitches against Milwaukee because they're still going to swing and miss a little bit. So I think he's in play. Um, do I want to get leverage on the field here at 7%? No, not really. Like, I, I'd probably throw up a little bit if I got a full 10% Kyle Gibson or even anywhere north of that because he only has a 16% strikeout rate, 8.5% swinging strike rate with a 25% CSW. This is, these are not thrilling figures. I'm fine with a good walk rate. I'm fine with a good barrel rate. And I'm fine with some ground balls in aggregate, buck 40. So I think that keeps him in play, but probably at about a 5% max for me, even against the hapless Brewers. I think you can play some Milwaukee here because Kyle Gibson, when he is bad, man, he starts floating the sinker and then everything just starts going over the wall. So, um... I think it's reasonable you see a, an abbreviated outing here from Kyle Gibson. And I also think it's reasonable that he somehow goes seven innings, strikes out nine or whatever against the Brewers because they're bad. So uh, it puts him in play. Uh, I'm really just kind of lukewarm on it for the most part. This is kind of who Kyle Gibson is and has been his entire career. He's just very hard to figure out. If you guys have a good read on Kyle Gibson, then, you know, let me know because I've been searching for years. On the other side, Freddie Peralta, he's getting 27% ownership right now. I think this is probably a little high. Um, I'm not sure. I love this price tag. Don't get me wrong. These are seasonal price lows for Freddie. But this is a horrible matchup. Do you really want to go after Baltimore here with a guy over his last four starts? Been really struggling to find it. Um, been getting picked apart. He, his last four starts, the changeup slider value that he was getting a lot of you know, relative to the field um, early – in the season, like that's totally evaporated. He's now given up a total an aggregate three outs to the field here on those two pitches alone. The curveball has historically been very good, and that's closer to a break even pitch for him as well. And the fastball, he's starting to spray it a little bit more. We're we're back up this is five and six ticks higher than it was last year, the walk rate to nine and a half percent. He's on the barrel, nine and a half percent as well. Uh so I think Freddie is, is really struggling here in the mechanics and trying to establish with the fastball and allow him to work to, you know, the, the slider and the curveball have never been like super excellent pitches. The curveball has usually been a, a, you know, a pretty equitable pitch for him. But with bad fastball command, you're unable to work to even... Um, slightly above average pitches and turn those slightly above average pitches into very equitable pitches, if that makes sense. So with bad fastball command, that's going to sort of filter down to definitely to the changeup. Of course, it's only a five and six mile an hour velo Delta on the change to the four seamer. So that's definitely going to be bad if the fastball is bad. And when you're not able to get ahead or in the, in, and establish with either of these two pitches, you're, Breaking stuff is going to be obvious when it's coming. Um, so that's why he's yielding outs back to the field there as well. So long story short, the swinging strikes are 
are still fine at 12%, but, I mean, where's the 28% K rate that we've known from Freddie Peralta over the last couple of, 30% even, uh, in the last couple of seasons? It's totally gone. Um, he's got a low strand rate here, so that may be contributing a little bit to the uh, the elevated suppression figures here, but they're right in line with where they should be. And I don't know. I, I think the walk problems are starting to resurface here a little bit. He's struggling to find the mechanics. And we had a very high ownership figure on him. So I'm not sure that I'm too jacked about coming in with the field here. Um, he's definitely going to make it playable, right? Make a lot of things happen. I'd almost in tournaments rather just take shots on Kyle Gibson. Do I like Freddie? I think is a better arm, certainly. But Kyle Gibson's got more in the tank that he can work with. I think a little bit more that he can survive with. So if I had to choose, I guess I'd play Kyle Gibson. I don't want to play either of them. Don't get me, don't get me wrong here. But um, I, I, it's okay. I'm I'm really kind of lukewarm on Freddie. This is a horrible matchup for him, and I'm not sure. Even buying seasonal price lows for him, we want to be going after Baltimore. Very high-powered offense against right-handed pitching. They're very dangerous as well. Even though they don't create a lot, they'll still hit for some power and some hard contact and get the baseball in the air and strike out at a below average, above average clip, I suppose. So I think Freddie, even 30% on this guy, like he'll be 30% in some stuff tonight. And I think that's too high. Um, I think there's some underlying questions here in the, in the arsenal and and in the metrics um so i'm probably going to come in under this number i think getting blown out by totally fading freddie peralta at 7700 is probably a bad idea but i i would like to come in well under and maybe even get to some baltimore and get some leverage on the field here i think it's a very very dangerous offense um even though they don't create at a hell hell of a lot um you know above average but i think it's very exploitable here to go after 30% Freddie Peralta, come in underweight on the mound with him, and then play some Baltimore stacks on the other side. Very sneaky and interesting tournament game there. Um, and I think we may have to get right to perform very well tonight. All right, let's move on. St. Louis and Texas. Uh, Matt Libertor on the mound for the cards. Not playing him against Texas. Um He's got an 18% K rate, 52% strike one rate, and a 12% walk rate here so far in his two starts and three appearances this season. 24% chase, it's just not enough. He's got an 8% swinging strike rate. So, like, yeah, sure, it's a nice price tag. It's nice ownership here, but this is a horrible spot, and I don't like the metrics at all. Um, he's so far right in line with where he should be based on the bat ball contact. 35% hard, really to both sides of the plate and mostly to opposite-handed hitters and righties. So that's with a total lack of a change-up here. He's not getting whiffs with a slider against same-handed hitters at all. He's surviving with a curveball sinker to same-handed hitters. But Texas, they're going to throw some righties in here and platoon against him. And their most dangerous left-handed hitter is Corey Seager. And, <laughs> you know, he's a top 10 hitter in baseball. So um, I don't want anything to do with Libertor here uh, against Texas. I like Texas. They're kind of down the road so far, or down the list, I, I should say, in terms of ownership. They're expensive, so you got to pay for Semyon and Seager. He's down to 5,600, though. He's been at 59 and 6 um, the last little while. 51 for Adelis Garcia, 48 still for Josh Young, but these guys are very much playable in this particular spot. Libertor is going to pitch to a lot of contact, full 83% here so far. And I think that's very attackable. This is a very dangerous offense. This record-wise, this is the second best team in baseball. So I want to get to them. Certainly, if they're if nobody's going to be playing them, they have the potential. One of the few teams similar to Atlanta and the Dodgers that can put up a 10 spot in any given matchup. So um, I want to get to some Texas here if I can make it happen. And I'm probably going to end up forcing some in because I like going after this and. They're damn good pivots off of the Dodgers and Atlanta. Dane Dunning on the mound for the Rangers. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get to correlated stacks with him, though. Um, he's been very good, and this sinker-cutter combination has been fantastic for him, really suppressing a lot of contact. But I think we got maybe a little bit of regression coming for him. He's got a 2-0 ERA. He's got bullpen appearances, so these are going to be like kind of... Um, noisy metrics here 2-0 ERA with expected about two runs higher 
strand rate is fine, 75, 78%. Guy with the ground ball rate, that's a sustainable figure. And Dane Dunning certainly has a ground ball rate, right? Buck 50 ground ball to fly ball in aggregate. It's really the, the hard contact to the right side, I think, is a little questionable here. He splits usage of the sinker and the cutter here um, to both righties and lefties. He should be using the two-seamer more to same-handed hitters and the cutter more to opposite-handed hitters. The hard contact here is elevated because he throws this cutter so much, and he doesn't get it off the barrel. He doesn't start it middle-middle. He starts it kind of on the inner half of the plate against righty, so it, it kind of tails back over the barrel to a right-hander, and that's what leads to an elevated hard contact rate. So I think that's a little susceptible. He needs to stop throwing this pitch so much to same-handed hitters, throw more of the slider, and focus on a two-seamer change and his show-me curveball to, um, to lefties. Uh, or excuse me, the, the cutter change curveball to lefties with the sinker slider to the righties, and that'll give him a little bit more balanced whip stuff. He's not really going to be a strikeout pitcher as it is. And at 7,200, even correlated stack, I think it's okay because you can go after the Cardinals a little bit. They've cooled off now, but this is still a super dangerous offense as well. And with Dane Dunning pitching to a full 83% himself, I'm not sure I want to go after the Cardinals either. This is a, still a pretty terrifying lineup to uh, start attacking just at will um, with Goldschmidt, Arenado, Gorman at the top of the lineup. He's kind of a, their staple three-hole hitter now. I'd, I'd prefer to get to some righties here because this cutter has been fantastic against the left side. Look at this hard contact rate against lefties, 17.5%. This is an elite figure. 11% soft is not super thrilling, but... When you're getting this many ground balls with that little hard contact, um, it's all just kind of rollover, medium, and weak contact. So I'm not super worried about that. Uh, I really need to see more whips from him, though. And if he gives up a, a, a run or two, he's probably not going to be all that deep for the game. Um, and he's going to have a very hard time overcoming that. So I'm probably going to have to leave him on the shelf, even though I like the ownership here at sub-7%. And the price tag is okay and playable. I don't like the matchup, and I, I just need more out of the strike, the strikeout stuff. Just not enough chase for him, uh, from him for me, I suppose. Uh, he's not going to walk people. He's going to stay off the barrel, so that makes him serviceable with ground balls. So he's got a little bit of suppression upside, but you're really kind of gambling that he can run deep into a game and... Um, and, and suppress a lot of the Cardinals' production here. So uh, is that in play? Yeah, but I'm not super thrilled about going out of my way to to get after it. So um, let's move on here to Coors Field and get to Sean Benaya. He's going to be the the long reliever here coming in after John Brebia, who is still 9,000 for some reason. Um, Manaya is 5,500. That makes, a, makes this a, a playable piece. However, he is Sean Manaya. Um, he's as enigmatic as Kyle Gibson, very hard to figure out. And I don't think he's very good, right? He didn't really have any one good pitch. The four seamer is break even change up is bad. And, um, and, and, and I mean, it, it's break even and bad. Uh, and the slider is terrible. So he's a three pitch guy. None of any of his arsenal is all that equitable for him. Um, he's got walk problems. He's got barrel problems. So, yeah, give me the Rockies here if you can make it happen. Now, this has been by far the worst team in baseball against left-handed pitching all season. Look at this creation. 65 WRC plus with a 128 ISO, sub-30% hard. They still hit a lot of line drives, similar to their numbers against uh, right-handers. But the creation is really leaving it on the table. They're striking out at a 26% clip. Because this game is at Coors Field, and Manaya has an 11% walk rate and a 14% barrel rate, I don't think you can play him. He's probably only going to go three, four innings here. Their strikeout upside for him in this particular matchup, because the Rockies, like we just showed, against left-handed pitching have been terrible. So that makes, that makes it a little... Um, a little playable. 
However, I mean, this is still a Coors Field, and I'm looking for a little bit of regression. This number is the 65 WRC plus is not going to persist all season, even though it's persisted for two months so far. Um, I'm going to look for a, a bounce, similar to how I've been playing the Brewers against left-handed pitching for a, a little bit of a bounce recently. I'm expecting a little bit more from the Rockies as well. And unfortunately, a lot of their better hitters are hitting from the left side. Uh, Ryan McMahon has been great. I'm willing to play him um, even in this particular spot against Sean Benaya. He's probably going to strike out a lot. But I'm, I'm willing to go after that because of high barrel rate, high hard contact rate. And, and McMahon's really been seeing the baseball recently. So I'm okay with that. Charlie Blackman, he's a career 300 hitter against... Uh, lefties himself, and I think that's playable. Um, so he, he's fine at 4,900. I like to get to Rocky stacks here with some of these cheaper pieces. Elias Diaz, not one of them at 4,900, but I still want to play him. Randall Gritchuk, a little bit um, kind of lukewarm on the price tag here, 4,400. Nolan Jones, he might not even be in the lineup tonight. We'll see what they want to do. They're a little bit more left-handed heavy, so that that's what would put Manaya in play. But again, he's probably only going to go three, four innings here. And this is a Coors Field. So this is a very dangerous spot. I don't think you're going to need to do this. This is a full 12 game slate. There's plenty of arms that you can play without having to eat this kind of risk on a super high variance pitcher with some bad underlying metrics. Um, you know, yeah, he's got a 60% strand rate, whatever. That's probably going to come up. 6-0 ERA with a 4-11 XBIP. Yeah, that's probably going to come down. But you got to start throwing strikes. You can't walk people, and you can't get on the barrel at this clip if you want me to get excited about playing you when you're only going to go four innings. So um, I'm not going to probably get to any Mania here. Um, I generally just don't play pitchers at, at Coors unless they're in very good matchups and, and, and they're good. Um, Mania, I just don't think he is one of those guys. So I'm going to leave him on the shelf, and I would like to get to some of these Rockies here, in particular Zeke Tovar or Brenton Doyle. Uh, and an Elias Diaz from the right side. Um, okay, let's uh, get to Denelson Lamette. He was not good against Arizona. I did mention that he was probably a playable. Um, and I think he pitched a little bit better. I watched that start. He pitched a little bit better than the than the numbers would suggest. He was not good. Don't get me wrong. Gave up five runs and sprayed ten hits or whatever it was in, in three innings. Um uh, he sprayed seven hits, gave up five runs, did strike out four. So I, I think yeah, he was a little bit more balanced than, um, you know, in the arsenal than some of the pundits would suggest. Um, he just couldn't find the strike zone. <laughs> like, he had r real problems throwing strike one here. And, of course, he's got, you know, 12 appearances out of the bullpen, but that really kind of persisted. Um, in his first start for the Rockies. I think he's still a better arm than he really displayed against Arizona. He is mixing in the four-seamer. He's come off of the two-seamer a little. He's got to be able to throw these for strikes, number one. Um, so it really kind of uh, relegated him, so to speak, to a one-pitch pitcher. And uh, the slider was all right for him. But he had zero fastball command. He couldn't he couldn't find any of it. So uh, whenever he did throw anything for a strike, it was right over the middle of the plate, and Arizona just kind of teed off on him. So um, I don't think that's what we're going to see every outing from Lamette going forward. Um, not, not to say that you could play him here, but I do think he will be better. He does have an arsenal now with the four-seamer sinker slider that, that plays at Coors Field, or can play. Um and historically, he's, he's always been a high ground ball pitcher um, at, you know, 1.6 ground balls per fly ball here in his, you know, abbreviated sample. Uh, I think that's still a very, uh, well, I don't want to say playable or attackable necessarily, but it, it kind of takes me off of the Giants a little bit. That said, there's still going to be variance with Lamette because he still throws a two-seamer. Um, and if you can't find the strike zone at all, I don't care who you're playing and I don't care what ballpark you're playing in. I would like to get to the guy on the, on the other side. So, um, San Francisco certainly going to be popular, but not as popular probably as they would be otherwise. So I think we'll get them under 10%. Maybe uh, some of these guys will pop for, you know, 15, 20 or, or whatever it is like a Jock Peterson, for example, he's probably supposed to be back tonight. Same thing with the Tyro Estrada. 
Uh, they're still too cheap for playing at Coors Field. Um, and they're fly ball hitters and they're they're power hitters, right? They're going to walk, they're going to strike out, and they're going to hit the baseball in the air. And that's really a, a good recipe at Coors Field. Um, you should see a lot of line drives out of them tonight against a high ground ball pitcher. So it doesn't mean that I think Denelson Lamette is in play or anything. I am off the Giants. I, I do prefer other teams tonight. Another couple that we'll get to um, here shortly. But yeah, I'm not going to fade the Giants by any means, but I do want to come off of them a little bit. I don't think Denelson Lamette is as bad as these underlying numbers are really showing so far. So, um, you know, I'm going to take a, a little bit of a wait and see approach. I'm not just going to smash and get over the Giants on the uh, relative to the field. Um, hopefully that doesn't burn me because uh, Coors Field tends to do that sometimes. But uh, I think it's very play. Don't fade the Giants. Um, but don't fade the Rockies either. I think it's a very attackable spot going after Manaya here. Okay, let's move on. Chicago and the Angels. Uh, Cubs here tonight are, have brought back up Hayden Wisniewski because somebody just went out. Uh, I forget who it was. Too many starting pitchers for me to keep track of. Um, 6,700 on the mound for Wes. And I like this arm, man, but this is a bad spot for him because he doesn't throw it past anybody. He throws a lot of strikes, and he doesn't walk anybody, so that's great. But... In his eight starts this year, he had an 11.5% barrel rate. They had to send him down because he's just a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy, giving up way too much hard contact to both sides of the plate. Doesn't have an out pitch against opposite-handed hitters. And the slider is really not a an opposite-handed hitter type of pitch generally. So you need some sort of off-speed or a curveball that you can spike in the in the bottom half of the strike zone, or you need to get the slider down and back foot, which he really does not do. Um, it's much better against right-handers than it is against lefties, and we see that translate 218 average, 273 Woba, and 127 ISO with a 21% K rate to the right side of the plate. Still give up a little bit of hard contact here, but we see that the suppression metrics against the left side are nowhere to be found. 316 average, 422 Woba, 330 ISO with a 14% strikeout rate to the lefties. 44% hard is way too high. So um, I think with kind of decreasing price tags on some of the angels here, at least relative to where they've been in the last week or so, Shohei Otani, 61, yeah, sign me up. Mike Trout down to 58 is playable as well. He's been north of 6,000 for a while now. Brandon Drury's still at 41. He's okay. Taylor Ward heating up a little bit more. He is back up at the top of the lineup, whether they'll have him in the one or the four or whatever they're going to do. He's 3,300. You can play him no matter where he is. Matt Thice as well. He's a cheap catcher piece, likely going to be in the middle of the lineup. They've dropped Hunter Renfro because he's been dreadful over the last month or so. And they still have a cheap piece down at the bottom with like a Jared Wall. She's still the stone min. So if you need to get there, that's playable. Um, I think we can go after some Wes with some lefties here for sure. Sign me up for Ote uh, Shohei Otani, Matt Theis, and even some Jared Walsh if necessary. But I really like Trout also. He's got like a 340 ISO against right-handed pitching over the last uh, 900 PAs against righties. So um, we're certainly not fading Trout. I want to get to the Angels a good bit. And as of right now, they're popping top five in value, but not so much in ownership. So I think this is very playable as a tournament and kind of off the board stack, even though the Angels can be super frustrating to stack uh, sometimes because, you know, they can go very cold. This is just an average creation offense against right handed pitching, just a 106 WRC plus average strikeout rate. They'll make hard and at a neutral ground ball to fly ball, um, you know, that makes them very playable. 170 ISO also makes them playable, but sometimes they can go cold and shit the bed. Um, is this going to be one of those spots here tonight? I don't think so. So give me a, a good bit of the Angels. Um, nothing correlated, though, with Tyler Anderson. I want to stack the Cubs also. So I think this is a very, very sneaky tournament stack here um, with Chicago tonight. I want to go after Tyler Anderson. I think he's totally busted. Um there's no suppression out of him. There's no strikeouts. This is down five and six ticks from where it was last year. He's walking people, which he's never done. He's not really on a barrel, which would really be kind of the trifecta. High contact, high walks, and high barrels. But um, that doesn't mean I don't want to stack against him still. He's only got a, as we said, 14% aggregate strikeout rate, and it's to both sides. He's not striking out lefties. He's walking everybody. 
and he's given up a lot of contact. It's mostly, in production-wise, to the right side of the plate. Now, he's always had a pretty good changeup, and that has made it a little bit difficult to stack against Tyler historically. Um, but I don't want to do that with the Cubs here. I mean, with him against the Cubs tonight. 118 WRC plus in aggregate, even though they've been pretty damn cold over the last two, three weeks. Uh, 179 ISO, they hit for a more aggregate power split adjusted than than the Angels over here. So um, 31% hard, neutral ground ball to fly ball themselves, more line drives even than the Angels as well. So at a, yeah, 2.5% higher strikeout rate, that does make them a a little bit more difficult to play in tournaments sometimes because they'll, they'll whiff and they'll go cold. But Tyler Anderson's not going to strike him out. He's not going to throw it past him. So he's going to pitch to a lot of contact, and there should be a lot of balls in play here tonight. I like offense a lot here tonight. Um, and and give me some of the Cubs. I think they're a pretty damn intriguing off-the-board stack here. Very playable price tags. Nico at 52, it's, it's fine in this matchup. Um, generally not great. Dansby at 52, also fine in this particular matchup. Ian Happ, prefer him a little bit more from the left side, but... He's 4,200 in the three-hole. Like, sign me up. Say Suzuki, 44. Patrick Wisdom, 4,000 flat. Jan Gomes, even, at 3,100. All playable pieces if you want to pivot to a Miguel Amaya, if you need the salary behind the plate. He's fine at 2,300. Very high upside catcher piece also. Um, Chris Morell is still egregiously expensive. He's 4,900. They might put him at the bottom of the lineup. Kind of unplayable price tag there, but he's a really shrewd tournament play. He's got plenty of power. Don't be surprised if he hits a, another bomb tonight. Um, so I want to get to offense here in this game. No pitching pretty much at all. Okay, let's get to the last game of the night. We're going kind of long here. Um, Seattle and the Padres. I want to play some Logan Gilbert here tonight. 9,900, nobody's playing him, and I think it is a super exploitable ownership figure. Um Compared to, who was it earlier in the 9K range? I've forgotten already. Uh, certainly not a Bryce Elder. Uh, Shane Bieber, uh, we're not, I'm not going to be dealing with that either. Um, I think I'd, I'd certainly prefer Logan Gilbert to like a Hunter Brown, who's at 10-3 tonight, and he gets a much better matchup. So he's kind of left off of the, um, uh, the left off the, the table here, kind of left out in the cold. Um just due to price tag, right? There's other guys at different price points that you're probably going to want to try and squeeze in. And he might just be left out just due to a, a weird construction kind of anomaly we've got going on here tonight. Um, I want to try and exploit that. I think this ownership figure is just too low. I don't like this price tag uh, for Gilbert generally because I think he's a little bit susceptible still uh, with – he he can get on the barrel a little bit sometimes. He's not going to walk me. He's going to throw a hell of a lot of strikes. Uh, but he can get on the barrel a little bit, too, to the lefties sometimes. And historically, he's done it with righties also. Um, and this is a dangerous matchup, certainly. But the Padres here are striking out at a one tick above average, or below average, at 24%. They walk at a full 12% clip against right-handed. This is an insane number for this kind of sample size, it's 1,600 PAs. It is huge. Um, I hope that number isn't wrong. I'm going to have to double-check that because that seems really, really high. That said, if it is right, it's an insanely high number. Um, probably mostly buoyed by like Juan Soto, who walks at a 45% clip. But just a 150 ISO, neutral ground ball to fly ball, not a lot of line drives, and 31.5% hard. All pretty average figures here for the Padres against righties. And the strikeout stuff for Logan Gilbert is 29% to both sides of the plate. I want to attack that. I think it's an above-average strikeout matchup. And he's got above-average strikeout stuff. So I want to I want to attack a very low ownership um, figure here at just 5%. I don't like this price tag, so that will probably keep my ownership down because if we see here in the value score, um, you know, that that's pushing him down near 20. We need this upwards of 30 and, and higher to be getting really jacked about starting pitchers. Um, but I think this median projection is probably a bit on the low side. Uh, it makes sense a little bit with the price tag, but um, overall, I think something seems a little bit fishy here. It's not really necessarily in the suppression metrics or anything like that. We're looking for probably about a run of regression between his realized and his expected with a 62% strand rate. That's a super low number. 
given that he doesn't put anybody on base, um, you know, for free in terms of walking people, and he stays off of the barrel, he's got a very high ground ball rate, buck 50 ground ball to fly ball to the righties. Um, I think we should see a little bit of positive, positive regression for Logan Gilbert. And I want to go after the Padres here with him tonight at very low ownership. He's a really good late slate play, I think. Um, and I think he's a damn good main slate play as well. You don't need to get a lot of him here at 10 12% to get good leverage on the field. And you don't need to expose yourself to what's admittedly a high price tag and a lower median projection. So I think this is perfectly fine to squeeze in some Logan Gilbert here tonight and get a little bit of leverage because 10% of your teams is 10% of your teams. And I think that's um, a pretty damn good play. I'm going to try and get to tonight for sure. Joe Musgrove on the mound, he's getting 30% ownership. And I think this number is too high. In general, I hate eating even very high, except when it's like perfectly warranted. Yeah, Seattle is bad, right, against right-handed pitching. They strike out a crap load as well. Below average offense pretty much across the board. Super similar numbers to the Padres over here. Um, neutral ground ball to fly ball still. Roughly the same hard contact rate. Buck 50 ISO, uh, 300 WOBA, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So... I think Joe Musgrove is very much playable because the upside is there for him in this matchup. However, like Logan Gilbert, yeah, yeah, he's 2100 more expensive, whatever. He's also 5% versus Joe Musgrove's 30%. So, um I'm I'm definitely going to have some Musgrove here tonight, but at uh at 7800, I think there's another um, who was it at 77? Freddie Peralta. These two guys are garnering 55% of the ownership or whatever it is, 60% of the ownership as an SP2 tonight. I think that's exploitable. I think you get off of that and pivot elsewhere, and that makes you instantly contrarian, and then you can get to the Dodgers. Then you can get to Atlanta, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, um, all the teams that you really want to play in a batter's box. You don't have to eat these ownership figures here tonight, and I'm going to try my best not to, uh, even though... I don't think the spots necessarily warrant full fades of these guys. Um, I think this is how we need to start playing DFS, right? And and we get into exploiting ownership and and trying to capitalize on some variants. Um, Joe Musgrove is certainly a variant pitcher. He can be very streaky. He's at a super playable price tag, and he may very well be streaking to the upside right now with two very good recent starts. Um, however... 60% ownership on, on him and Freddie Peralta, I think, is, is probably a bit aggressive on a full 12-game slate when we've got 85 pitchers that we can play. Uh, so, that said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have some still, but it's it's very unlikely to be uh, anywhere close to 31%. Um, even with this projection and price tag delta, I'd still rather play Logan Gilbert because I think a 5% ownership figure is far more far easier to exploit with the rest of your build and the rest of your team construction than is 31%. So uh, that's how I kind of want to approach this game. Pitching almost exclusively, um, or maybe even a Seattle piece here or there, like a Jared Kelnick, 4,400. I like that price tag a lot. 52 for Julio, that's fine too. And maybe a Cal Raleigh, 4,300. I like a little three-man there getting some, some late leverage off of a very popular Joe Musgrove. Uh, okay, that's it for the breakdown. Went kind of long here, so let's clean this up and get out of here. White Sox, Yankees. Uh, I want maybe a little bit of Giolito, maybe some Clark Schmidt, but like, eh. I'm kind of lukewarm on the game pretty much uh, all the way around, so um, likely to just leave it off for me. Uh, Mitch Keller and Pittsburgh pretty much exclusively here tonight. I don't want any cap uh, or any of Oakland outside of a one-off Seth Brown to um, leverage my and, and hedge my Mitch Keller exposure. I'm going to get a lot of him tonight, I think. Uh, Arizona and Washington. I like Arizona a lot here. Not so much Tommy Henry, uh, but I, I think Arizona is one of the better stacks that we can get to that are, are not, you know, one of the top three popular ones. Um, you can play some some Washington pieces here or there as well. I don't think that's horrible against Tommy Henry. Houston, Toronto, pitching almost exclusively. I don't want to go out of my way to target these guys, but I'm still going to have some Jordan Alvarez and maybe a little bit of Kyle Tucker as well. It's very heavy ownership on Kevin Gosman. If I had to choose between the two, uh, you don't, but if I had to choose between the, the two, Gosman and Hunter Brown, give me Hunter Brown instead. I think this is a plus upside matchup for him against Toronto. 
even though I'm not super thrilled about a north of 10k price tag in this matchup, I mean, if I had to choose, I'd fade both of them and just pivot all of it over to Mitch Keller. But um, I think they're both playable and in you know, should be in our pools. Dodger, Cincinnati, uh, offense exclusively. No pitching here for me. Um, definitely not Luke Weaver. Give me some Cincinnati, though. Really like Jake Fraley at 4,900. And you can play Matt McClain as well. Um, but absolutely Dodgers if you can finagle good teams with uh, with the price tags and the ownership. Boston, Cleveland. Uh, Boston maybe a little bit also. I think they're a really off-the-board stack here. Um, way, way down the list because they're expensive. And Bieber's still good. But he's giving it up a little bit to left-handers this season, far more so than it, than he has in the past. So I don't really want to play him. I think he's too expensive. And the whiff stuff's just not there. I'm going to do the same thing with Paxton. Probably have a couple of shares, but um, I don't like loan after Cleveland. And I'm still kind of in wait-and-see mode. I'm, I got depth questions with Paxton here. I need him to go more than five innings um, and, and fully suppress to get really excited about it at his particular price tag. Mets in Atlanta, I want offense exclusively here. Uh, and I do like the Mets as an off-the-board kind of stack. And um, I want to go after some Bryce Elder. I think regression is coming for him, so I'm going to start stacking against him and, and probably go broke in, in the meantime uh, until it does happen. But, uh, hey, we got there earlier in the season with Jack Flaherty. So, you know, maybe uh, maybe the same thing's happening with Elder soon. Atlanta definitely against Cookie. I think he's fully broken as well. Baltimore and Milwaukee. I think it's a really interesting tournament game. I think everybody is in play here. Freddie, less so because of the very high ownership. Kyle Gibson, yeah, because of the very low ownership. And I don't know, he's just Kyle Gibson. Um, but Milwaukee and Baltimore, very. Baltimore I like here for leverage against Freddie. And Milwaukee I like a little bit for, you know, kind of variance leverage, so to speak, against Kyle Gibson. He is not great. And um, that's certainly attackable. St. Louis and Texas. Texas, absolutely. Um, I really don't want anything to do with Libertor, and I love Texas. This is one of the teams here that can put up a, a 10 or a 12 spot, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in any given matchup. So, yeah, give me a lot of that. St. Louis, probably not. I respect the changes that Dane Dunning has made. He's going to pitch to some contact, so that's fine if you get a piece here or there. But they're well down the list for me. San Francisco and Colorado, I like both teams. Uh, offenses here. Definitely Colorado. I think Chamanaya stinks, uh, even though he's got a little bit of strikeout upside, and the Rockies also stink. Uh, I, I This is st still at Coors Field, and uh, I want to go after him. He gives up a boatload of walks and barrel contact, and even though Colorado's bad, I'm looking for a little bit of a regression there. San, San Francisco, definitely, if you can make it happen, uh, ownership-wise. But it kind of takes me off a little bit with uh, Denelson Lamet. Uh, I think he's a little bit better. Um, Cubs, Angels, offense only, and I like the Cubs a, a pretty good bit here. I think this is a pretty decent play at Pickham in the, in the betting markets, too. Um, going after Tyler Anderson, pretty sneaky here, and if I had to choose between the two offenses, give me the Cubs, they're far cheaper, but I, I really like the Angels here as well tonight. Uh, Seattle and San Diego, mostly just pitching, but maybe a short Seattle stack and a lot of Logan Gilbert, if I can make it happen. Um... You know, I would be perfectly comfortable with like a full 15% or something of Gilbert tonight. I'm going to come off the Musgrove and the Freddie Peralta ownership. I think these numbers are too high, and there's tons of other guys we could play. So I think I'm going to try and do that. Um, okay, so that's it for the breakdown. Sorry we went kind of long here, guys, but uh, big 12-game slate. Um, once again, keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates as we will push those throughout the day. And good luck to everybody on this huge Tuesday.